So we're very glad to have Richard Ramkumar from Berkeley. And he's going to tell us about the about the tangent space, the Hilbert schema points in P3. Yeah. Hey, uh, I'd like to thank Ravi for uh, inviting me to give this talk, and it's a pleasure to be here. So as as he said, um, I'll be speaking about the tangent space, the Hilbert schema points in A3. So the abstract says P3, but we'll just stick to A3. It's more or less the same thing. Um, and this is joint work with uh, Alessio Samartano. Okay, so um, we'll just fix some notation in the beginning. So K will always be an algebraically closed field. And whenever you see S, it's a polynomial ring in N variables. Um, that N will eventually become three, but S just means a polynomial ring. And our main object today is the Hilbert scheme of D points in A N. So it's a moduli space that parametrizes um, ideals in the polynomial ring of length D, um, because this is affine space, we are just gonna work with ideals. Um, and as you, of course, there's a more general definition of Hilbert scheme, but we won't touch that. And I'll denote it shorthand by HTN. One, one important thing inside this is that there's this connected component called the smoothable component, and it parametrizes D distinct points in AN, and it has dimension N times D. Okay, so this is all, I'm gonna call, always mention this throughout the talk, and it's just useful to have it written up here. So why, the, why Hilbert scheme of points in affine space. Well, out of all the Hilbert schemes, the Hilbert scheme of points um, tends to have um, interesting uh, algebraic properties, particularly with respect to singularities. So I have a chart here that will tell you what's known about these Hilbert schemes. So we start Can off with- um, of, yeah. about the smooth. So are you taking the closure of this locus or, or, are, you, or are you just taking that, that open uh, yeah. itself? Yeah, good, good, good point. Um, I will uh, take the closure, right. thank you. Thank you, yeah. Okay, yeah, I was, yeah. okay. Thanks. It seems yeah, strange yeah. to call it a component if it's not yeah. a component, okay. So in, in, in my head, it's the closure, but that's right, good good catch. I'm thinking the closure. Um, yeah, so H1D um, is just points in, uh, sorry, it's just D points in A1, those are the, the divisors. So this is isomorphic divisors of degree D. So this Hilbert scheme is isomorphic to A to the D. Um, it's smooth and irreducible, nothing much to say there. Um, H2D is much more interesting. Um, and it's very well studied, but from, from the perspective of irreducibility and smoothness, this was shown by Fogarty. Um, H3D, however, is where you start to see singular um, Hilbert schemes. So this is smooth until three, three points, but after that, it's always singular. Um, and irreducibility is quite interesting. So it's known to be irreducible until 11 points. There is some characteristic zero assumption here. Um, however, it's known to be reducible starting with 78 points and nothing is known in between. So people don't really know how many components this Hilbert scheme has, for example. Um, with respect to singularities, um, it, it is known to be, this Hilbert scheme is known to be the singular locus of the hypersurface inside a smooth variety. So it's singularities are also restrictive. And I don't know the, I don't know where this first appeared, but it is in this paper by, uh, by these two authors. We can move on to the Hilbert scheme of points in four space. Once again, it's, uh, it's smooth until three points, singular afterwards. It's irreducible until seven points, um, but it's reducible starting at eight points this time. So unlike the, the three space case, you know exactly when it transitions from irreducibility to reducibility. Uh, singularity is um, not, nothing precise is written, but it's expected, I believe, to be messy. Um, in particular, uh, I, there is no analogous statement as a Degeneracy locus of some hypersurface. Actually, and can, you can keep going. Can I ask about that in the uh, threefold case? Is it so? Is it actually known that there's some singularities that don't? I mean, is that there was at one point a proof that was not that didn't work uh, to say that not every singularity is not. Is it known that not every singularity can exist on a in H three D when D gets big? like so that really does. So I. Mean? So I, I, I that's um. I, I don't, I don't, You're I don't think that's written down. I don't know. Okay. So I, I don't, I don't know. So yeah, I, I don't know about that. So the state of the art is this, that it is the, it is a single locus of a hypersurface. So the, I don't know the answer to your question. Yeah. But, but very possibly at least that may constrain. It's very possibly it's not, yeah. Um, and um, if you keep going all the way to 16 space, um, you probably saw a few months ago, um, Joachim Sh um, explained to you that, um, he showed that a, the Hilbert scheme satisfies Murphy's law of the retraction. 
Um, and statement of irreducibility and reducibility is the same. So seven points irreducible, D points reducible. So my goal is to, well, my goal is to convince you that the Hilbert scheme of points in three spaces is interesting. And I want to uh, do this by showing you how it's sort of in the middle. For, for two space, it's all very nice, very well understood. For four space and above, it's expected to be very bad. In the middle, you have this, um, you have this boundary where it's sort of the transition point and then not much is known, but so I hope it's interesting. Um, hope I convince you it's interesting to study. Because not much is known, um, I want to just focus on the uh, sort of the first thing you would consider if you want to study singularity, and that is the tangent space. So, what is the tangent space? So, given a point in the Hilbert scheme, which is an ideal in the polynomial ring, um, the tangent space is just this S module. And for concreteness, I want to study the following question. So, so given given an ideal, so I'm going to just treat this as a point in the Hilbert scheme. So it's in three space now. How large is the dimension? So this is the dimension of the k vector space. Okay. So this is the question I want to study. So how big can the tangent space dimension become? So before we get into all the um, more uh, the harder properties like what kind of singularity occurs and things like that. Just numerically, how big is the tangent space? So this is going to be the question you want to keep in mind. Okay. So to do this, um, we can sort of reduce to certain special points. And uh, let me explain how to do that. And that's by using a group action. So the general linear group acts on the polynomial ring by changes of coordinates. So it also acts on the Hilbert scheme. Um, Inside here, you have the uh, Borel subgroup of upper triangular matrices. And inside here, you have the uh, torus of diagonal matrices. Okay. Okay, so just general theory tells you that if you start with the point I in the Hilbert scheme, um, there is a flat degeneration to, I guess, I prime, which is say torus fixed or Borel fixed. Okay, and if it's torus fixed, um, this I prime is going to be a monomial ideal. And we can do this because we're only interested in bounding the tangent space dimension. So by upper semi-continuity, you can degenerate to um, a torus fixed point and, and if, or a Borel fixed point, but we'll just stop at the torus fixed points. Um, furthermore, um, say you were torus fixed, but you were supported on, um, so this is, imagine this is like uh, an element in the Hilbert scheme. This is some sub-scheme of say A3, can't really draw. Uh, but say you're supported on distinct points, you can further degenerate it so that it's just supported on one point. So if I prime prime, so now I'm going to assume I prime prime is torus fixed. So it's a monomial ideal. And it's supported the origin. Okay. So for the rest of the talk, whenever I say, whenever I talk about an ideal I, it's always monomial, always supported the origin. And our goal is to just bound the tangent space, um, the bound the dimension of the tangent space to such a thing. And along the way, we'll actually um, study a lot of the properties of the tangent space. Okay, um, anything else I should say? Oh, I should point out one more thing. It's a known fact that the monomial ideals lie inside the smoothable component. So remember, I was saying that not much is known about all the components of the Hilbert scheme, but the, the, the ideals you understand, the monomial ideals, they lie on the uh, smoothable component. They, they probably lie on multiple components, but at the very least they lie here. So. I think if that is easy or hard, you, I guess you can just sort of pop off the points kind of separately off the- Yeah, that's, that's easy. That's an, if, if you know it's an it's essentially initial idle computation. So this, the degeneration here, when you degenerate to a torus fixed ideal can be made very explicit by taking initial ideal and you can essentially polarize and take an initial ideal to get from a- right to get from a set of distinct points to um, any monomial ideal. 
there's like standard techniques to do that. It's easy. So in particular, um, the dimension of the tangent space to monomial ideal is at least 3D. So we're in, we're in three space now. And so this, this will come back later. Okay. So this is on the setup, but now let's, um, let's do an example. So this is not really an example, but this is a warm up. I'll just state the facts. So here's my first example. Um, three variable polynomial ring and let N be the maximal ideal. So I told you that the Hilbert scheme is smooth until three points. And so at four points, it should be singular. So what is that suppositely singular point? Well, it's the square of the maximal ideal. So just assume for now that this thing has uh, the, square, the square of the maximal ideal has co length four. And I will tell you how to compute this later. And the dimension to this, the tangent space to this is 18. And so the Hilbert scheme has dimension 12 because four times three. And so this is indeed, um, this is the singular point. You can actually show, let me put it here, that the dimension to any other point, say monomial, but in particular any point is at most the dimension at the square of the maximal ideal. Okay, so for this example, the square of the maximal ideal has the largest uh, tangent space dimension. So now you can try to you know, play around with the examples. You can go to five points, six points um, and keep going. And one pattern will emerge. And this is a conjecture um, of Priyansen and Uribino. So they state the following. So let D be the, um, the co-length of the Power, any power of maximal ideal, then, then for this Hilbert scheme, so for Hilbert scheme parameterizing length D sub schemes where D is this, you have the following bound. So um, well, I should point out that this is not saying something about every single um, Hilbert scheme of points in, in A3. This is this only the points, um, only the lengths where the power of the maximal ideal appears. So what is that? Like just maybe put that in here in red. That's um, a certain binomial coefficient. Oops. So for all these um, values of D, there is a natural candidate for this upper bound. So they had a conjecture for all values of D, but that's known to be false. Um, and yeah, so I won't get into that right now. But in the case where the max power of the maximum ideal does appear, it is somehow clearly the largest possible dimension. Okay, so that's the state of the art, and this is still open. And my the goal of this talk is to uh, prove this conjecture um, in some cases, and I'll explain what some cases means later on. But before we do that, um, I do want to um, state one on a result of our paper, which is a proof of a weakening of this conjecture. So I don't want to get into this, but it's worth pointing at writing down. So here's a theorem. So, so at this point, yeah. all the statements are sort of in theory, all it's all something you could combinatorially get at, but you just are not going to be able to win by just using, yes. which is like very, the complexity is just way too, it's unclear. Yeah, the, it's unclear what it is. So um, I'll, we'll see this more on, but somehow um, our, our, the main point of our work is to show that you can, actually get at to sort of improve on the combinatorics of what's known. So a lot is known for the combinatorics in the plane, um, but these natural extensions are way too um, complicated in, in A3. So one of, so I'll, in this talk, I'll tell you how to sort of reduce the complexity and sort of get at this conjecture. But that's the, that's the strategy. This is combinatorial, you want to do this, but many of the things you try to do is just way too complicated in three space um, and so on, yeah. So with, with some of the techniques I won't get into, you can prove a weakening of this. So again, let D be this co-length, then the dimension of the tangent space is at most four third um, the tangent space to the power of the maximal ideal, so let's say for all i. So of course, this is not the um, conjecture because this conjecture has a nice one 
but if we, we pop in a 430, you can, you can get to it. Um, this actually uses some combinatorics, so that's known now. And if you were to replace I with um, some, some constraints on I, you can of course improve the bound. But if you ask for all I, the best you can put there is four third. And um, surprisingly, this actually gives you sort of a new bound on the dimension of the Hilbert scheme of points in A3. And that's because the, you don't know the components. So you can have all sorts of weird components of uh, large dimension. So um, I'll just like, I'll just leave this as a comment. Gives, gives a bound on H3D for all D. You can sort of embed the small Hilbert scheme in a bigger Hilbert scheme, at, well, at least each component. And so you get an upper bound. Okay. And this and that bound is also new because once again, you don't know what all the components are. So the, the approximating the tangent space is sort of the best known thing to do. Okay. okay. So I want to spend the rest of my time um, explaining how to um, prove uh, cases of this conjecture here. And I also want to tell you um, about the common networks involved. So I'll start with the case of the affine plane um, and show you how people, I guess, usually did the common networks there. And then I'll show you an altered interpretation that will generalize to the, uh, to the affine, to the, to the three space. All right, whoops. Um, let's uh, do that. So this is the theorem. And yeah. So here's, uh, so to, to tell you how to do the combinatorics, I want to remind you about gradings. So if you have a ideal in a polynomial ring, so this time I'll just go back to Xn, but you can just imagine N is two or three. Okay, so this ide any ideal is Zn graded, right? Just because each of the variables has a degree one, so that induces a grading on the ideal. So this then induces a grading on the tangent space. The tangent space is also Z and graded, and I'll you'll see you'll see examples soon. So you can decompose this. And so, sorry, I'm assuming this is the monomial ideal. Remember, I is always monomial. If I was not a monomial ideal, I'm not sure what uh, grading there is on the ideal, but because it's monomial, there's a Z in grading. And Actually, so- Just yeah. before the top of the page disappears, that's only, for, so we only have that good a bound on the dimension Hilbert scheme in, in three space, or do you have like similar bounds in n in So you can, uh, you can um, extend our arguments to n space here. Um, it's it's the nicest point. in three space, let's okay. put it that way. Um, so so the original, so the, the original, the authors, Brienz and Irvino, when they made the conjecture, they gave bounds in all, all dimensions. Um, this, our techniques will improve their bounds in all dimensions, but it improves it by a lot in three dimensions because, and this is because of the combinatorics of Borel fixed ideals in, uh, in three dimensions. So it's really good in three dimensions and just okay in four dimensions. So, so there, there, is, there is an analogous thing you can do, but it's the best in three dimensions. And that's why I'm just gonna focus um, on that. Okay, so you can, so you can, so the grading on the tangent space. All right, so keep this in mind and now we'll do some examples. And I'm gonna do examples in two variables. So I'll start by telling you how to compute the co-length. So if I give you a monomial ideal, how do you know its length? Okay, let's do that. This is where pictures come in. So here's, going, here's our ideal. So this will be the ideal we'll do everything with for the next 10, 15 minutes. So it's so in the polynomial ring in two variables. Um, three generators, x cubed, x squared, y squared, and y to the four, okay? And I wanna compute um, its co-length. So I wanna compute this thing, the length of S mod i. And what is that, by, what is that? Well, that is precisely the, the dimension of the span of all the monomials not in the ideal, okay? If you find a basis for S mod i, you get, um, you get this length, right? Very zero dimensional. Okay, so the combinatorial way to do this is as follows. You represent, um, N2, um, so you, sorry, you represent the monomials of the polynomial rings um, as points in N2. So 
So you do this by taking the exponent vectors of a monomial. So, so this is like the plane N2. Um, usually you'd have points, but you think of the points as a box, right? So I can actually write something inside. So the point zero, zero here is this box here. The point one, zero here is this box here and so on, okay? And zero, zero should correspond to the monomial X is zero, Y is zero. So that's the monomial one. Maybe I'll just put this in the box for now. So that's the monomial one. One zero is the monomial X. Um, two zero is the monomial X squared. Here's Y, here's X, Y. And it's, if there if you have any questions on this, please ask. Um, here's Y squared, X, Y squared, Y cubed, X, Y cubed, and then so on. Um, where, do the, where does the ideal fit in this picture? Well, you first put the generators of the ideal, which is what I have here, y to the four. Then I put the other generator, x squared, y squared, and I put the third generator, x cubed. Being an ideal means that if you multiply by x and y, you're still in the ideal. So anything here is in the ideal, anything here is in the ideal, anything here is in the ideal. Similarly, anything here and here in sort of this quadrant above that generator is in the ideal. Similarly, anything in this area is also in the ideal. So the monomial ideals kind of divides the plane into the staircase where things above the staircase lie in the ideal and things below the staircase do not lie in the ideal. So all the monomials inside here are in S mod i. They give you a basis of S mod i and all the monomials outside this pink border give you um, pink border, pink. give you the give you gives you a basis for i. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, so once you have this, you go back to old color. So once you have this, you can count the um, the co length of the ideal. It's precisely the points in here. So the boxes in here. So there are ten boxes. Okay. So that's how you can sort of see it pictorially. A little bit more algebraically, we're doing the following. We are, uh, okay. so we are taking an ideal i, right? And we're writing it, we're writing as the following direct sum. So you can see the grading here on the ideal. So if you weren't sure what, what that was before, it's now here. So an ideal is a direct sum. This is a monomial ideal. So it's a direct sum of smaller mon monomial ideals as follows. And because this is um, has zero dimensional, this has finite, Length, and so there are only finally many non zero. Non zero BIs, and then the length of this is just the sum of the BIs. And we can see this in this example if I do it neatly. So I have x q, I have x to the zero, y to the four, right? Because y to the four appears in here. Then I have x to the one, y to the four. Then I have x squared, y squared. And at this point, x cubed appears. So I can just put y to the zero and then so on with zeros. Okay. So I'm doing this slowly because it'll be important later on, but this is how you would compute the co-length of any monomial ideal. You This is in two variables, it'll extend to higher variables, but just for two variables, you can sort of draw this picture and do this staircase diagram, or you can just decompose it directly with the grading and count, okay? Okay, so that's the co-length. Now I need to get to the tangent space. So we use the same picture for the tangent space, okay? But uh, we upgraded a little bit. So now for the, just for computing the length, we were only interested in the upper quadrant, but now we kind of want to deal with the other parts of the plane too. So you just treat them as zero. Yeah, so, so, so the things here that were not there in the previous, in the case of computing degree, are now just considered zero, okay? So it's just, think of them as zero. So they're neither, they're in the ideal and they're zero. And S mod I is all just the points here. And I'll explain why, that'll be useful later on. Um, and so now I'm gonna explain how to um, describe tangent vectors using these pictures. So for people who know uh, who know these things, the first thing I'm gonna do with arrows is, I guess what everyone has been doing 
as what was what originally done by Mark Heyman in his proof of the unfactorial conjecture and was sort of the standard way to get at um, tangent vectors. And then I'm gonna give you uh, um, our alternate interpretation of the same thing in terms of, uh, well, it's an alternate interpretation that will generalize. Okay, so what is a tangent vector? So a tangent vector is you just tell where the, tell, just tell people where the generators go. So here's one tangent vector that I wrote down. X cubed goes to X, X squared Y squared goes to Y squared and Y to the four goes to zero. And now I'm going to uh, represent this on this picture, okay? So remember that in this, um, in this staircase picture, each point, each box represents a monomial. So X cubed is over here and mapping X cubed to X um, amounts to writing down this arrow. Mapping X squared Y squared to Y squared um, amounts to writing down this arrow here, okay? And when X, Y to the four goes to zero, nothing happens. I just leave it, all right? Um, a valid question is to ask, is this a well-defined homomorphism? And you can check that it is true, but there's a way to put an equivalence class on these arrows to show that it's a well-defined homomorphism, okay? So just believe it's a well-defined homomorphism for now. I, I, and I, was you can, sure, I was pretty sure you were gonna send Y to the fourth two boxes to the left though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you yeah. can, but I will, I will just leave it, I will just leave it empty for now. Okay. Yeah, the, the, I'll just leave it empty for now. So you, you'll see why I don't, I don't do that in the next example, um, because um, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. So this is, this is, um, yeah, th this is a tangent vector, um, but the, okay, so hold on, let me try again. Yeah, so we represent a tangent vector by these arrows, okay? Now the, because we only, we, we only um, describe what it does on the generators. But you're, you also kind of want to know what happens to all the monomials, right? In the, in the ideal with non-zero image. So here's the list of them. Um, essentially what you're doing is you're just using the fact that it's an ideal and just multiplying by X and Y and seeing how the homomorphism is, is defined. So for example, this was X cubed, right? You can look at X to the four, right? Because X cubed went to X, X to the four has to go to X cubed. Uh, x, x to the four has to go to x squared, okay? Similarly, y, um, over here we had x squared, y squared going to y squared, um, which is over here. Again, just by multiplication by x, right? Um, x squared, sorry, multiplication by y, x squared y cubed here has to go to y cubed, okay? And so it's useful to keep track of all of this simultaneously. And this is where, um, if you're used to sort of the arrow perspective, there's, a, there's, a, there's an alternate way to think about this. And that's by um, doing this following operation. So let me, so I want to define the tilde of any monomial ideal to just be its set of exponent vectors. So it's basically what we've been doing, but now I'll sort of formalize it and say, and if, if you see a tilde on a monomial ideal, that's the set of exponent vectors. And this is now just a subset of n to the n. And I'm going to do the following. So I'm going to take my monomial ideal i. I'm going to shift it by minus two zero. So minus two zero is the degree of this uh, homomorphism. As you can see, everything goes down by two degrees in x and it's the same degree in y, right? x cubed went to x, y, x squared, y squared went to y squared, y to the four went to zero. So it's the degree minus, it's degree minus two zero. And so I'm going to now do the following shift. Okay, so, so this pink line here is I tilde, okay? And I'm gonna shift I tilde minus two zero, minus two to the right, minus two to the left, sorry. So it's here, um, down here, here, it looks like that, okay? So this is, whoops, not this. So this stuff here, everything over there is, is I tilde plus minus two zero. But then I wanna take the complement of I tilde. So that gives me these things. Okay, so if you, so originally in pink you have, well, let me, let me just put something. So in pink here is I tilde. You shifted it to the left by two, by two boxes. Uh, and then you took the complement. 
Okay, so you're left with the boxes in the middle here, right? And so what this is, is that, so, okay, why did I do this, right? Perfectly valid. But these are precisely all the monomials with non-zero image. So you recover exactly these eight monomials here, okay? So this is like a minor shift in perspective, but it's quite useful. So usually what's done is that you draw these arrows and like uh, Ravi said, you send y to the four to zero and you put an equivalence relation on them. That gives you a tangent vector. What you can do, and I'll, I'll state a precise proposition in a minute, is you can actually just uh, do an operation on a subsets of the plane. And this whole, all the set of these boxes collectively is the tangent vector because it, keep tra it keeps track of the whole uh, non-zero image, okay? That's a, that's a lot to take in, but that's kind of what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna give you some more examples. Um, before I give more examples, any questions about this? So you're about to tell us that you're gonna say given certain subsets of the boxes, or maybe it's the, I can't tell which is the original, but certain subsets of the boxes, you're going to tell us where everything goes. And what the tangent vector is. Uh, it's, it's, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's different. I'll, I, no, it's slightly different. So okay. this is the original and well, you'll see. Maybe I'll do more examples. So here's more examples. So um, let's look at this one here. X cubed goes to X, X squared Y. So here's X cubed um, and I'm sending it to X squared, uh, X squared Y, which is over here, okay? It's degree minus one, one, right? Um, now, and this, is, this answers the question of why I don't send X squared Y squared also um, from here to here, but that's because, um, because this is a grading, I can, it, I can write this as two separate tangent vectors and take the direct sum. So over here, I'm sending X squared Y squared to X Y cubed. So I have a tangent vector here, okay? So these are two different tangent vectors. In the first one, I send X cubed to X squared Y and the rest of the generator to zero. In this, in this one, I send X cubed to zero and y, y to the four to zero, but I send X squared Y squared to X Y cubed. And of course, any linear combination of these two is still a tangent vector, okay? Um, and once again, I'm not writing down arrows for where, where when I send it to zero. So, and so let's see what happens if I do the thing I explained previously by shifting and taking complements. So I'm going to shift this by minus one to the left and up one because that's our degree. Uh, where did I go? I go, oh boy. This one's a little annoying. Uh, I have to shift up, minus up and one. So I think it's like this and then this. Okay, so that's shift to the left by one and shift up by one. And if you take the complement, you get two, two blocks here. So again, this sees the non-zero images. And what's happening here is that because you have two linearly independent tangent vectors, so you can, that's, it's evident that they're linearly independent if I tell you their map on the generators, but, pict but comment, like pictorially that's represented by the fact that these boxes are not connected by a path. So there's are two disconnected. Um, you shouldn't, this is, you shouldn't think of this as a, with a usual topology on, on, a, on Z squared, but if you have two disconnected boxes, they're sort of two different tangent vectors. Okay. Um, let's do one more and then I'll try to state a proposition and then we'll get back on track. Okay, so what happens if I shift positives, right? I've been shifting, I shifted minus two, zero, minus one, one, what happens if I shift one, one? Well, then you just land back in the ideal, right? So remember, if you start, if you start with an X, I, Y, J in the ideal, and you map it to X to the I plus one, Y to the J plus one, this is still in the ideal. So it's just the zero tangent vector, okay? Let's see what happens if I apply the shifting operation once again. So I'm gonna shift by one, one um, up here. Up here, up here, up here, up here, up here. And now if I take the complement, I get an empty set because well, I shifted into the into the ideal. So in pink was the was the whole ideal, and then I just shifted it in, I shifted it inside. So the complement is empty. Okay, so the zero tangent vector was just this empty thing. Okay. Any questions about what I'm doing. 
so this is a proposition. So this is the, this is the shift in perspective that will let us do lots of things. So the proposition is the following. So the set of bounded connected components of the shift forms a basis for the tangent space in that degree. So I've not explained bounded, I'll get to that in a minute. Connected here should mean as if uh, there's a path in, inside the, uh, inside the complement that, that stays, I don't wanna to say too much, but if I can make it precise if people have questions, but this is not connected because they're not touching essentially. Um, while this whole thing is connected because there's the path inside that, uh, inside, this, inside this area between, every, between any two boxes, okay? Um, that can easily be made precise. So that's what I mean by connected. And what is unbounded? So let's see what happens if I shift in negative degrees. So if I shift in negative degrees, right? Minus one, one is what I'm going to do. So let's shift everything back by minus one. Over here, over here, over here, over here, over here, over here. And now if I were to take this complement, right? Remember the ideal is here and I shift it back. I get all of this thing here, everything there. So sort of, it goes off, it goes off on forever. And that's unbounded. Um, because it's not bounded in either X or Y, okay? And so that actually ends up being a zero vector. Um, there are different ways to see this, but in the interest of time, just take it that this is zero. So there is no tangent, no non-zero tangent vector in this direction. And if you were to believe this proposition, oops, that you have to be bounded, you can actually just see that if I ever shift in the negative direction, I'm always unbounded. That's simply because my ideal will look something like this, and when I shift back, it'll look something like this, and I'll just get the complement will just be this bound, unbounded stuff. Okay. We did so much, we did so many examples, but now we can get back to um, what happens uh, when you use this grading. So uh, let's get back to the Hilbert scheme of points in, in the plane, okay? So this is the Heyman's original proof of the smoothness of this. Fogarty proved it smooth. Various people have proven it smooth in various different ways. Heyman needed this for, for certain combinatorial reasons, and he gave an explicit proof of the smoothness by giving a certain bijection between tangent vectors. Okay, and this is sort of an interpretation of his argument, but in terms of these uh, boxes and then taking complements by shifting, not in terms of the arrows you've seen. So you can decompose the tangent space into four pieces depending on. Um, whether the uh, index is positive or negative. So, so first of all, the tangent space decomposes into, as we saw with the Z2 grading. And then if the first index is non-negative and the second one is negative, that's one piece that we're gonna consider as a whole. Um, if the index is negative, can you hear me? I feel like my video got stuck, it's fine. Okay, if the, index, if the first index is negative and the second index is non-negative, that's one piece. And similarly, if both the indexes are non-negative and if both the indexes are negative, okay? I'm going to um, give them a special name. So in the first case, because the first index is non-negative, I'll, I'll think of it as positive. It's, it's unfortunate, but um, that's how we chose our labeling. And because the second index is negative, I'll just put an N and say it's negative. And then I'm gonna, Take this whole direct sum, I'm gonna call it T sub Tn. Similarly over here, I'm gonna call this T sub Np um, because the first index is negative and the second index is uh, positive. Over here, I'm gonna call this T sub Pp because both of them are non-negative. And then the last step I'm gonna call this T sub Nn because they're both negative. Okay, if you remember the examples I did, the last thing I said was this is zero because I'm shifting both in the negative way. Right, that's, that's over here, okay? Um, I also explained to you that if you shift both in the positive, well, I did it for one, one, but of course the same argument shows if you shift in the positive direction, you land in the ideal. So it's also zero, okay? So this thing is also gone. So you only have sort of, in, in terms of this grading and decomposing in this way, you have sort of two um, subspaces of tangent space. And Heyman's argument, if you were to, well, if we were to use this argument, it essentially shows the following. So it shows that the tangent space to Pn of i is the length of the, of the ideal, the dimension of Np of i. Okay, 
So that's um, oops. So that's what uh, Mark Hayman's work shows, and this implies that the Hilbert scheme is smooth. So I, I, I didn't prove. Are, are you going to make it transparent why those two qualities hold, or not yet? All right, that's too much. No, no, I, I, I I'm not, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to get into this. That's that's the, right. needs a little bit of needs a little bit more work. I can say that later if people have questions. But the it's a perspective change. So he what he does is something more. He decomposes. Um, he's able to get a handle on essentially each of these sub uh, subspaces, um, and he essentially uh, shows an explicit bijection between this space and this space. Okay, um, using his theory of arrows. The problem with this is that it does not generalize well to A3. And then people have tried to generalize it, but if you try it, it gets way too complicated. However, if you were to just let go of that bijection, just numerically consider the subspace as a whole, like this, and that will extend very naturally. You can actually control its dimension, and that's going to be what I'll talk about next. So this is just a reformulation of what he did, um, but I don't want to get into his exact, uh, his, uh, his exact proof, but his results will generalize for it like from this perspective, okay? So this proves it's smooth. Um, yeah, but let's, uh, let's get to what we're going to do. So we're gonna take this perspective of decomposing this into these PN, NPs, and PPs, and NNs. They'll be sort of the signatures of the uh, tangent space. And we're gonna do this in three space now. Um, so now we'll just get to theorems and things like that. So if you got lost in the details, it's, you can just sort of Zoom back in and uh, pay attention now. So here's the idea, take an ideal in three variables. Um, as I mentioned previously, you can, and this is monomial. There's a Z3 grading on this. And similar to the previous one, I can decompose this on, in terms of like the signs of, uh, in terms of sign of each degree. So PPN will be the direct sum of T i j l where i is non-negative, j is non-negative, l is negative. Okay, so p, p, and n, so non-negative, non-negative, negative. negative. Um, let's use another one here. Let's do n and p. So that's again, t, i, j, l. i is negative, j is negative, l is non-negative. Okay, so negative, negative, positive. And you can do this for all of them. Of course, you would be expecting eight of them, right? Because there's this, when all p's are positive, and the all negative one. But for the same reason it will, as it was in the case of the affine plane, these are zero, right? So that proposition I told you about shifting is actually true in all dimensions. So for that reason, these kind of vanish. But you can also see this explicitly. So you have these six subspaces, okay? And um, it turns out uh, quite surprising for us that there's actually a duality here, quite similar to the uh, case of the plane. So in the plane, you have to remember that because it's smooth, uh, that's kind of somehow like correlated to any nice symmetry you have. Nothing bizarre can happen. But in this case, however, you have a sort of a very singular tangent space. So you have to somehow account for all these singularities. And that's done by decomposing as follows. And so here's um, sort of one of the main results of our paper. It's the following dualities. So take any monomial uh, point inside this Hilbert scheme then the following equalities hold. So the signature where two of them are positive, which is this one, is the same as this one, the, the dimensions, of course, not, so this is not giving me an explicit, give you an explicit bijection. So the dimensions of this one is this one plus D, where D is the length of the subschemes you're considering. Similarly, if you have P and P, so two positives here, it's the same as again, two negatives plus D, and in this case, again, two positives is again, two negatives plus D. So, okay, okay. so something, this is really, something surprising is, yeah. super surprising is happening here. So you're saying, I guess, you're saying there's not a bijection. There's not like an almost bijection between these two sides. And you might hope, I guess you, you described the two dimensional case. In the one dimensional case, one of the two is gonna be zero. The other is gonna be zero plus D in your, yeah. in your, in your picture. So, it's, so, so somehow something very, I can't, not that I can see the pattern, but there's some sort of pattern like uh, there's some, um, you're making some vague claim about this, there being an actual duality of something, this being an artifact of some sort of duality that 
Yes. Yeah, so the, the, this is this is the, like this is kind of like the bizarre thing here, right? So this is numerical. So, so there's, I, no, I, there's no, it's numerical. Not like there's no for four. You get something similar. Yeah, no, for four, no, for four you don't. That's 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 the whole. The four you don't. One, two, so one, two, and three you do. And then but two and three you do. So two you get a very nice oh, one. And it's, one as well. One as well, exactly. Three you get this, but like you were saying, where you drop things, set things to zero, it does not extend to four. So. You can, can, you, can you toss in the thing I would want to also toss in is the grading is the, so the multi yes. and and for it to play well with respect to that grading and your sort yeah. of, if you count how many of each rating appear is there any relationship or it's there's no it's like uh, these are qualities are the similar so, so 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 here like this the reason this is surprising following so it's everything you said um, um yeah so it it you're asking the right question. So the, the thing is, if you, you, if you make it very fine, so if you refine the grading, make it very fine, like you said, with the three grading, um, it's a huge mess. And that's exactly um, why this was, I guess, not noticed before. It's because if you stick to sort of the fine grading you get in the two-dimensional case, and it was very, it was very well behaved, and there was actual bijections, it's all over the place. Uh, you will not be able to actually write on a bijection, at least we weren't able to. Um, people I spoke to were not able to. So. I'm sure there might be something, but we don't know at the moment. However, if you sort of just let go of the fine grading and sort of do this, right, this like much coarser um, subspace, then you'll actually see numerically, at least there's a relation. So that's the surprising part is that we, if you're not able to get at this as a bijection, but you can get at this numerically. So, so the, only way, the only way to know how to show two numbers are equal is either by uh, either by bijection if they're integers or by showing the, the dimension of the same figures. Like yeah. That, that's not yeah, so, how do you do it? Yeah, so so the, no, that, so the latter is what's happening. So it's uh, so it's it's a combination of certain Euler characteristics and like duality with Homs. So it's it's just it's a well, how do I want to so there is a bijection, right? I mean, of course, like okay, so maybe I should be precise here. There is of course a bijection. But it's not a natural bijection where I would be able to use the fine grading and tell you that, hey, look, um, i, j, k, where i and j are positive, corresponds to something with i, j, k negative. So I know I have two, two modules have the same dimension um, because of, say, sort of, say, Euler characteristic reasons. But there's, I mean, I don't, I cannot take something with um, a given grading and give you a vector with another given grading. So that's really what I mean. So I, I don't, I don't, uh, I guess, yeah. There is a bijection, of course. It's it's not sort of the. It's not one that respects the fine grading. That's what I want to say. Does, does that does that answer your question? I guess you're just telling me that there's a bijection in the dumb sense. That if I give you two yeah. vectors of the same dimension, of course their bases, being that's, the same that, size, have a bijection. Which yeah, is, that's so you're basically but, telling me that I'm wrong. Yeah, you're just telling me no. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm essentially telling you no. And in fact, like, the, the, so we want one which is fine, right? That's kind of, that was the goal. But instead, we got this. But you take this, what is, you this is what we have till now. Yeah. Uh, so so let's, let's see what you can do a lot of things with this. So let's, here's the first thing you can do. So the first thing you can do is actually, in many cases, determine if your um, point is singular. Okay. So here's the first corollary. You have a smooth point um, if and only if these the tangent faces where you have two negatives are all zero. Um, let's see, let's see why. Right, so I'm going to just cut this. Oh no, I can do this right here. Okay, so why? Well, the tangent space decomposes into, these, into six subspaces. And so the dimension of Ti is 3D plus, um, well, I'll say the sum of the dimensions of T sigma i, where sigma is, has two negatives, I guess, n and p, n, p, n, p, n, n, right? So this is using these dualities plus this decomposition here. And I told you that um, this lies on the smoothable component. So its dimension is at least 3D. So you kind of need, you, you cannot have any tangent vector that goes uh, 
negative in two directions. Um, why is this uh, useful? Well, if you had an if you had a nice reduced subscheme, you can actually sort of geometrically think about tangent vectors, and everything is great. But these monomial subschemes are non-reduced, so you probably need algebraic ways to get at their tangent space. So, so does that you, mean you have, you have examples of smooth points? That are not complete intersections. You can now yeah, really the, say, yeah. you can now say, look, here's some weird, crazy things that are actually yeah smooth. Smooth, yeah, exactly. So you can this. So from a computational perspective, this is um, quite. It's actually simpler. So you, it's easier to just check whether these NNPs and NPNNs are actually zero. And then we have given certain gen, given certain relations on the generator, so bounding degrees and things like that. You can get a large class of smooth points. And I, I did not have that prepared, but it's in the paper. So yeah, the answer but, to your question is yes. But, but now this is gonna be easy to check. You take your three-dimensional shape and you're saying mm -hmm. smooth if and only if you just can't shift it, you know. Yeah, down you, if you shift it. And, and when you do that, you just never see anything. Uh, yeah, you get something unbounded, basically. You get something unbounded or it doesn't shift properly. Okay. That's, right. okay. yeah, that's, that's very direct. Right. Yeah, it's, cool. it, it, it's very direct. And I'll just give you an example to Shay. So if I were to just give you a yeah, can I ask you a question like, before you do yeah. the, yeah. the previous? Is there supposed to be a factor of two in front of that sum? Uh, yes, you're right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, there is a factor of two because uh, you have six spaces and then three of them decomposes into 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 this, and so it's two copies of each six. Yeah. Um, that's right. Yeah. So there, there's a factor of two there, and which, which is actually going to show up in, in one of the later corollaries. So the example, which I mean, it's I'll just so we just gave you this ideal. Um, of course, there's something to check here, but this looks like a complicated ideal. Um, you don't have to compute its whole tangent space. You can just exhibit one vector going in sort of negative directions, as Ravi pointed out. And so here is one vector, tangent vector. It sends the generator x, y to z cubed, others to zero. So this one has degree minus of course, degree is minus one, minus one, three. And this is a well-defined tangent, ve tangent vector. So you have to, I guess, check that. But if you do that, you, you have already um, shown that this is a singular point. Okay. So this is, a, this is, this is one use of it. Another and, use of this. And, and you know nothing about it. You have a tangent vector. And you got it like, that's all you know. And then bingo, it's not, bingo, it's not, bingo, it's not, bingo, bingo, it's not smooth. That's, that's right. Yeah. So, and, so and yeah. We also have a parity condition on the tangent space. Yeah. You, you recover that too. That's right. So this is a, before. That's a right? Right? I, you recover suggests that I knew it before, but I didn't know that before. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is that. No, oh, sorry. Sorry. I kept on, you keep on interrupting. No, you. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. You're, you're about to tell me. Yeah. So this was known by Berend and Fantechi. So, they, I mean, their proof was also an Euler characteristic proof, but of course it uses uh, much more sophisticated machinery because uh, there were, uh, I mean, they were, they were sort of doing certain Donaldson, and Thompson, and Thompson invariants and things like that. And they showed that, um, so I'm not an expert on that, so I don't know exactly the details of it, but when I skimmed it, um, it, was, it was much more sophisticated. So they showed that parity, that the tangent space has the same parity as the, I guess I should put, I should say what D is here. So for all the I, D in the Hilbert scheme and okay. I is monomial. So that was monomial, not, not general. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that was monomial. And this and this duality gives certain, it's intrinsic. So I never left the Hilbert scheme and I just dealt with ideals. And then, so this, this theorem here gives the proof of that. Sort of, I would say, let's say a simpler proof of that. Um, so, as was pointed out, I had an error here. This is two times that. So if you just take this mod two, you have the dimension of the tangent space is 3D mod two, and that's just D. Okay. So that's that. Um, and I have two minutes, so I need to tell you why I did all of these. So what is what do you do with this duality, right? We had a conjecture way back in the beginning, like what is that the tangent space dimension is bounded by the power of the maximal ideal. So thanks to this duality and this decomposition to show that conjecture that the tangent space is bounded by the tangent space to the maximal ideal, it suffices to just do it for these signatures. So let me let me just end by saying that. So goal, what was the goal? Show that dimension of Ti was dimension of TMR. 
So thanks to those decompositions, it's enough to show dimension of T sigma, dimension of T sigma MR, and where sigma was, I mean, it was a bunch of them, right? P, P, N, P, N, P. Well, I, I'll put them all because N, P, N, 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 P, P, N, N, right? So it's this, but by the duality, right? These, these, these three are related to these three. Like, so this one is this one plus D, this one is this one plus D and so on. So I don't have too much time. So I'll just say it's enough to show this. I'd write that down again. So it's enough to show it's enough to just show it for the where there are two positives, right? Because of the duality. And um, now I'm going to assume I is Borel fixed. So the reason is that it's because I get more combinatorial properties. So I can also assume I is Borel fixed. So this, this is like a smaller class of ideals than the monomial ideals, and they enjoy a nicer combinatorial description. And so here's the sort of the last theorem I have for you is the following. So for I borrow fixed, um, the dimension of this is at most the dimension of this for, so here's the, here's the reason this is not the full conjecture. It's for two out of the three signatures, so. PPN and PNP, and I'll explain, I'll say a little bit about why. And you get a little bit extra with equality in either case, if and only if um, I is the power of the maximal ideal. So I just want to end by saying why only these two, not the third one. That's because of the uh, common total properties of the borough fixed ideal. So it's, it behaves very well with respect to, so the borough fixed ideal. Once you fix your Borel subgroup, it prefers a part, prefers some um, one, two of the components of your grading and not the other one. And so, depending on with depending, so I chose upper triangular matrices, so it prefers PPN and PNP over NPP. And so, which is why you can use the commutator of that plus all the shifting to prove this. Um, if you're worried that oh, because this, but this prefers the grading, therefore, maybe there's a counterexample to conjecture when you have NPP. So the claim I have to that is that um, all of this is not precise, but the our arguments won't work when, for the for the for the monomial ideals or the borough fixed ideals that are close to being smooth. Okay, so this is not a precise statement, but the arguments don't. So for all the ideals where this will fail, like experimentally and where you know come up with counterexamples, the tangent space is very far from the maximal ideal. It's just that because of the preferred grading, it goes the wrong way. So it's it's not like it's going to fail at the missing one. It's it's likely to work, but it's still open. And uh, I'll leave it there. <laughs>